It's incredible. You can feel the torque split between the front and the rear as you get on throttle. Welcome back, I'm Tedward, and thanks to Craft Detailing in Dedham, Massachusetts, I'm driving this Porsche Taycan 4S. No, it's not the Turbo S, that's the, that's the heavy hitter, but the 4S is more likely what folks are gonna be buying, and this EV is what I'm most excited about in the field because it's not a Tesla, and it's performance-oriented. It's from our friends in Stuttgart, so it's gotta be good, right? They can't give us a bad car. Quick specs, it's got 563 horsepower. It has two electric motors, one in the rear, one in the front, and the rear motor actually is made into a two-speed gearbox. Love it or hate it, eh, I don't know. I think it adds complexity, but we'll see how it drives. When you approach the car, the door handles pop out for you. And when you're driving, they retract for aerodynamics. Inside, we'll get there in a minute, but it's a nice place to be. First, I just wanna show you what it's like for storage because you need this to be a practical vehicle. So you've got ample room in this trunk. It's not incredible, but it will do the job. You definitely get your luggage and a few golf bags in there. And because you have no engine up front, you've got a little bit of room up here to open it. And then we slide that, up we go. Nothing crazy, but a little smuggler's box to put the extra stuff or your charging adapters. Personally, I'm really in love with this design. These headlights are fantastic. It's futuristic without being outrageous and obnoxious. And there's charging ports on both sides of the vehicle, which is very cool. It reminds me of the old, like 1985 Aston Martin Vantage where you've got dual fuel filler flaps. You swipe down here, that opens up and you're good to go. Let's take a seat in the rear, because at the end of the day, this is probably gonna be kind of a family car. Uh, this seat's pretty far back, but I still have ample leg room. And we have this monster glass roof, which is really nice, except for the fact, and I'm gonna give this little point to the Tesla, we've got a fracture on the glass here that's getting replaced under warranty, of course, but we like to give Tesla such a hard time about their build quality, Porsche is not infallible. Okay, enough about that. Let's get in and go for a drive. Immediately, I'm greeted with a very Porsche feeling cabin. And of course, we start it on the left. All digital gauges. In fact, there's even an optional screen over here that only works when someone is sitting in that passenger seat. To put your Taycan in gear, we have this little guy up here. It looks just like the little Braun Razor shaver that you have in the 911, but now it's on the dash. If we get on it a little bit, You can feel that transmission kick in, but also you notice it's very, very quiet. But this button right here is programmed to give us some kind of fake noise piped into the cabin. Gives you that warp speed kind of vibe. And yes, you can notice and hear it kind of shift because it is literally shifting a gearbox. Go take it on some back roads, pop it into sport mode. The way it gathers speed is so incredible. Oh my God, and it's silent. That's wide open, I mean, seriously. Big complaint for me on the driving dynamics, the brakes, that pedal's a little vague. There's not a great initial bite. I want more out of that first piece of the pedal. I'm not getting it. Let's put it in Sport Plus. I want you to see how fast this gets up to speed. You're expecting a shift noise? Oh my goodness. It's, I, I'm not joking, like I'm expecting a flat six or you know a Panamera GTS V8. This does have four wheel steering. Ooh, look at that turning radius on a dime. At 4,700 pounds or a little over even, you'd expect it not to be able to boogie the way it does, but because these battery packs are mounted so down low, the CG is low and that helps. So although it doesn't mask its weight, its weight is in the correct location, very low in the chassis. And we've got all wheel drive, so you can put the power down in pretty much every possible scenario. Let's feel out these brakes. It's 
incredible. You can feel the torque split between the front and the rear as you get on throttle. That is just wild that this handles like this. I have not felt a performance EV like this. This is this is outrageous. This is <laughs> wow. And and by the way, nobody's nobody's angry. Nobody's the wiser because I'm silent. I'm silent. This is the silent killer, man. What's incredible is the way you can feel as it starts to get into some slip with that rear end. It starts shifting torque. You can feel that torque split mid-corner. Oh, it's a smart vehicle. I mean, frankly, one of the most important things about the Taycan is that it's still a Porsche. In the question of like, does it handle like a Porsche? Absolutely, this handles like a Porsche. This is so planted. Before we talk about some of the cons and drawbacks to this vehicle, uh, namely the range is, is what people are most infuriated about. Let's just talk about the concept of owning an EV at all. A lot of motorheads really, really dislike the future of electric vehicles. They do not want to accept it. They do not want it because they love their engines. I love my internal combustion engines as well. Uh, I don't think that they're going away completely. I mean, I'll, I only buy used vehicles and I keep them for a long time. So even if they stop making them, I think I'm going to be okay for quite a while, hopefully the rest of my life. But the idea of introducing an electric vehicle into my garage is so appealing. And if for no other reason, just to stop being asked the question, which motor oil should I use in my M3? Oh, I hate that question. But to be honest, the, the, the maintenance on these things, ooh, what a beautiful thing. There's very few moving parts. And that's one of my issues with this having a transmission. If this didn't have a transmission, it would be less complex, therefore less prone to failures. But overall, your experience with, oh my God, that's like a quarter throttle. This thing is such a rocket ship. Overall, your, your, your only th maintenance items are gonna be consumables. I mean, you're not changing oil. Basically, the only thing that can go bad is you know, you've, you've, you've used the useful life of your battery packs, um, or there's some sort of catastrophic failure with something else in the car, which is probably unlikely. Something else that's definitely worth noting is the comfort level of this vehicle. I put it in normal mode. Oh, you heard that gearbox, it just clunked a little bit. And I don't know if you'll really get it on camera, but it is a little bit clunky. Porsche claims that they made it clunky, that they, they could have made it completely seamless, but that they wanted the driver to be able to feel it. Uh, but anyway, back to comfort level, I guess that's part of it. You put it in normal mode, the suspension is nice and supple, it's absorbing things, but you know, you, you're still certainly in a sports car. But unsurprisingly, when you pop this Porsche into Sport Plus, it just becomes an animal, an absolute beast. Look at this. You have to kind of recalibrate your brain for the for what it's doing. You hear that downshift? Let's see how it handles the bumps. This has some bumps right here. I'm very curious. Not bad. Hard on the brakes, in. Oh, wow. A little bit of slip from that rear. It's so balanced. That's what I mean when I say it doesn't hide the weight because you still have to manage it. But holy cow. All right. This, this brings joy. This brings driving pleasure. Oh my goodness. The big strike against the Taycan when it came out was the EPA range. It was only at like 210 miles, which just is, is laughable compared to the Model S, honestly, because the Model S is out there churning out something closer to 500. I'm not a huge nut on these things. I don't know enough about them, but I do know enough that it was significantly less. What I'm told, however, is that Tesla basically designed their vehicle around that test. They kind of gamed that. So although it does objectively probably have a longer range, um, that test isn't everything, right? Like you take the SATs, you do, you do okay. It doesn't mean you're a dum-dum. It just means that you weren't really prepared for that test. Oh my God, this thing is so crazy. I can't believe the way it sorts out the road. Wow. What a beautiful machine. But if range is your number one concern for not buying this vehicle, let me inject this little piece of information. A Taycan 4S 
just set the EV cannonball record. If you're not a cannonballer, a cannonball is driving from New York to Los Angeles, the Red Ball Garage in Manhattan, to the Portofino in Redondo Beach, as fast as you can in one shot. So for a petrol car, a gasoline car, the record is 25 hours, 39 minutes. For EVs, the record is something like 44 and a half hours. This used to belong to Tesla. The Tesla 3 actually set the last cannonball record, and then Porsche just beat it with the Taycan 4S. This is really important because it tells you that their charging network is in place, that you can actually travel coast to coast in a Taycan at all, whether you're doing it very, very quickly or not. Let's go back into Sport Plus. <laughs> a gear shift. But it also tells you that the car has enough range to drive at highway speeds, at 85 to 105 miles per hour roughly, and make it to the next charger. That's huge, that's massive. That is a huge accomplishment. And that is only going to get more and more impressive as time goes on, as chargers get faster, as battery technology gets better. In the next few years, I do think that we're gonna see those cannonball records creep into the 30 hour range. But for those who base their decision on writing off the Taycan based on its range solely off of that, that aspect, that range aspect, I would implore you to look into uh, out of spec motoring's record with this car coast to coast. There is in fact a range mode in this vehicle that is uh, designed to help you maximize how far you can go. You can only go up to 70 miles per hour in range mode. So if we go over it, it's limiting us. It's crazy. I'm actually floored right now. All right, maybe not if I floor it. It does have some safety aspect to it. So we don't get into too much trouble. That makes sense. Smart Porsche, but I can add just a like a little too much throttle and uh, it doesn't go anywhere unless I really ask for it. But if we go back to normal mode, cruising on the highway, it's a Porsche. If you've ever driven a Panamera, this is kind of what that feels like. It's a good place to be. It's a safe place to be. It's comfortable. It's agile. And you've always got this torque on tap, ready to go. That's a rough little Cayenne. All right. There's one other aspect of EVs that I think goes overlooked that I genuinely have grown to appreciate. And that's the fact that there's no slack in the drive line. When you drive a normal internal combustion car that has drive shafts and connection points and all this stuff. Over time, those connection points weaken, there's rubber, there's bushings, and eventually, you know, you start getting to this point where you get on the throttle and you can feel things kind of move and wiggle around a little bit. I don't feel any of that with this. And I would imagine that over time, because there's really just motor to wheel other than that rear transmission, there's not going to be any slack. You're gonna always have this very crisp response foot on pedal action and there's never going to be any like kafunk that happens in these vehicles and it just goes to show that the maintenance part of these vehicles isn't simply oh i don't have to do an oil change it's that there's all these other components of the vehicle that you're just never going to have to think about that you'll never have to replace that you'll never have to worry about and every time i see an off-ramp i just need to go back to sport plus Again, not a fan of these brakes. Trail brake into this corner. Sorting me out. Wow, it's a genius. Uh, to be honest, I think the car is like almost at GTR levels of like video game. Like this is pretty idiot proof. I, I think it's borderline uncrashable. Um, I'm sure some folks will prove me wrong on that in catastrophic ways, but sure, sure, there's a Turbo S there. There is another vehicle that is faster. There's a trim level above this, and yeah, you are going to pay for it. But I think it's worth uh, really respecting and appreciating, A, the range on the quote-unquote slower model, and the performance. This is no slouch. Unfortunately, with electric vehicles, it's a tale of two systems. On the one hand, you have Tesla. They have their supercharger network across the country. They're very simple, they're very easy. They're more like Apple. And then you've got the Electrify America network that's going to service pretty much every other OEM. And unfortunately, families are going to end up being tied to an ecosystem because if you've got even Tesla chargers in your home, well, I mean, maybe the Taycan's not gonna be on your list because it's like, ah, well, I've already got all the infrastructure for it. Or if you travel with your family a lot, you bring two cars, 
maybe there's places that are more convenient for the Electrify America network versus the Tesla. So even though your spouse wants a Model S and you want a Taycan, maybe it doesn't really work out that you can both have them at the same time. This isn't an issue with gas-powered cars. If you drive two gas-powered cars, regardless of brand, you can stop at all of the same places that that, that any other gas powered car will stop at. So here's what I'm looking forward to. Number one is like, how will EVs unfold in America? How will people adopt these? Are we gonna get lots of cheapo, gross EVs that like I don't wanna drive? Or are we gonna start getting a lot of cool sports cars? The sports cars are what I'm interested in. And maybe not the sports cars that are the GT3 or Ferrari equivalents, although they're going to be incredible and fun, I will not be able to afford them. What I can't wait for is to feel out what companies like Mazda do. I can't wait to drive the Miata equivalent of an electric car. Because guess what? Even if it's slow relative to its supercar peers, it's going to have gobs of torque and it's going to be much faster than its gasoline powered counterparts or predecessors. So hats off to Porsche, please fix this brake feeling, maybe give it one pedal driving capability and extend the range to just silence everybody who's complaining about it and ignoring this car because of it. I am blown away. The performance of this is is just is just staggering and that's such an overused word, but here it's appropriate. Thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. Don't forget to respect the drive and I'll see you in the next one. And of course there's no engine, so we don't have that typical Porsche tachometer front and center, but we do have a speedometer and we've got the ability to have these LCD displays adjustable. So you can change what you'd like, whether you want it the map or uh, your power meter. I prefer the power meter. And then over here we can change uh, what this is displaying. So you have like really incredible control over what this thing does, which is just absolutely wild.